which leads us on to the very last keynote of today, um, which I'm happy to say uh, is from uh, Alexander Refsum Jensenius, um, who comes from the world of music. Uh, and his, in his keynote address, he will talk to us about how his research group is experimenting with open research experiments. Uh, opening up the research process from beginning to end, asking the question, is it possible to do experimental music research completely open? And what can we gain by opening up the research process from beginning to end? So, um, warm welcome to you, Alexander. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a music technologist. And uh, I'm very interested also in open research of various kinds. And uh, I should start out by, by saying that I prefer to say open research instead of open science, because I'm, I'm coming from, um, from the arts and humanities. And then science is not always uh, covering uh, what we are talking about, particularly when you're doing artistic research. So, so I think that's kind of a broader, um, broader uh, word to use. Uh, so in a, in a way, you could say that my research is on the intersection between art and science in different ways, and I'd like to think about this as a continuum, not as a categorical two different categories. And I also like to work between both nature and culture, natural sciences, and also uh, social sciences um, in, in my work, and I will give some more examples of that. So that's kind of placing, placing what I'm doing. Now, um, I'm um, going to talk about um, a pilot study that we're doing at the University of Oslo right now, which is called Music Lab. Um, and, and I thought I should just give you a, a show you a, a short video demoing um, what this is about um, before moving on uh, later. Let's see if you can click there. So that's it. Um, but then um, to, ex to get into some of the challenges we have been facing here, uh, I need to, to, to rewind a little bit and, and talk a little bit about, about where I'm coming from and, on, and why we are, um, are doing this now. So I'm, I'm co-directing a center, a center of excellence at the University of Oslo, um, which is a very interdisciplinary center working between um, studies of uh, written time and motion. And this is a collaboration between the departments of musicology, psychology, and informatics. So we are working very much in between the different, uh, different disciplines. This is a visual summary of, of our center and what we are working on. And human rhythm is kind of at the core of what we're doing, trying to understand the meaning of rhythm in human life and how we can really change the way we are thinking about how our cognition works by using rhythm as kind of a, a structuring kind of uh, principle for, for the way we interact with the world, really. Um, not going, going into details there. Um, but this is a fairly large center. We are now full, 50 full-time researchers working on this, so it's, it's a pretty, pretty large center. Um, and, and we started a couple of years ago and going to run for eight more years. So, so lots of exciting things coming out of this in, in the years to come. Now, methodologically, we're also covering uh, widely from the softest soft to the hardest hard, as we like to say. So we, are, we have people working uh, from the humanities perspective with, with reading, uh, listening to music, doing music notation studies, um, looking at the sound. We do different types of behavioral studies with motion capture, physiological sensors, eye tracking, we do some fMRI, um, brain imagery, we do EEG, um, also some intracranial EEG. Um, our computer science people do machine learning of various kinds, we do some robotics, and we're also going to do some rehabilitation towards the end. So as you see, it's a pretty, pretty wide coverage of, of different methods, and uh, we're trying now to also to figure how do we bridge over between these 50 uh, researchers plus guests and uh, students, etc., in our center, and how can we, how can we really work together and, and also bring in some open research principles into, into this work. So I'll, I'll focus a little bit on my the special, specialization in all this, which is looking at the role of the human, uh, the human body in, in music. 
Um, so, um, my research is, is really based on understanding how we move uh, in relation to music. And many of our studies we do in a motion capture lab that we have. With, uh, we put on, on, on the suits with markers on the body and you can move around and you can get very nice uh, quantitative results uh, of how your body moves. Um, and you can also to look, at this, uh, look at these things. Um, so we are, we are studying how musicians move when they, they play, um, trying to look at everything from kind of more coarse body movements and also details in, in fingering of pianists, looking at also, this is from a drum study, we're looking at fills like boom, um, and then trying to figure out what's actually going on there when, when the drummer plays 200 kind of different things in two seconds, right? And trying to understand both the biomechanics of this and also how um, the sound is, is being produced. Um, then we're also trying to understand more about how we perceive uh, music. So we've been carrying out a series of air performance studies, people playing air guitar, air piano, etc. Uh, trying to understand people's experience with music by looking at what they do, um, because people are very bad at talking about their own musical experiences. It's much easier to look at them and try to figure out what's, what's going on. Um, we have also been looking at people, how they dance to music. We take them into the lab and we put on music and, and look at what's going on. Uh, more recently, we've also been interested to look at what's going on on the inside, looking at, then, for example, muscle tension, what's going on when, when you're listening. Um, and my own also uh, current ongoing project is on uh, standstill in music and how music moves us even when we try to stand still. So we, we run a Norwegian championship of standstill every year. The uh, next one is in March 2020, so if you're in Oslo at that time, and also Trondheim, by the way, we're running there too, uh, then come and participate. Um, but I'm not going to talk so much about what we do. I mean, it would be fantastic to talk about that too, but I'm, I'm more going to talk about how we do this and, and how this kind of relates to um, some of the topics of, of, of this conference. Now, um, when you think about research and the research process, um, that typically starts with an application. Then you get to the research, or well, at least if you are lucky and get funded, you, you, you get to the research part, and then finally you get to the output part. As we know, um, this part here is definitely a black box. This is a black box, and this is a, if we are lucky, it's a grayish box at the moment, but uh, it has been quite black, but it, it's getting grayer, I guess, uh, as, as we go, and many people have been talking about this. Now, the challenge then is to try to figure out, okay, how can we think about this then from an open, open research perspective? And, and we have had many interesting presentations here today, so I'm kind of going to repeat some of this. But um, you could, of course, if you start on the kind of the application side, I, I'm, uh, I think it's a very interesting idea to kind of move more towards open applications and op also open assessment, even at the application stage. Um, then, of course, we can think about different types of open notebooks or open lab, uh, lab notes and these type of things. Open methods, of course, open source, open data, citizen science could be in there as well, open manuscripts, open peer review, open access, open educational resources, open scientific social networks, open citations, open assessment, etc., etc., etc. So, I mean, this is a complete ecosystem. I don't have to tell you much about this. Now, I'm kind of, today I'm going to dig in on the kind of the research side of things because um, that, I think that that's um, maybe the most relevant here now. I'm also involved in some uh, of the policy stuff on, on, on the end there, open assessment part, but uh, I'll leave that for another time. Um, so, so we'll stay in this, this kind of part of, of, um, of the ecosystem uh, right now. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about open access. Um, I've been advocating this for throughout my entire career, actually, and, and I've been making things um, openly available. But I have been bitten several times, and I, I'll just mention one. Uh, I know that we have Springer in the room as well, but uh, I did publish a book with Springer Nature um, some years back. It was an anthology that I, I produced, and I, it, I have to say it's... It's embarrassing, really, I have to say. This price tag here for the ebook, it's, it's really embarrassing. And when I, when I tell my students about this, or if I go around and, I, I, yeah, it's, it's just not acceptable, sorry. This is, this is really bad. And I don't get that money, to be honest. I, I don't get that money. Anyways, uh, on the positive side, um, when we developed this anthology, and this was an anthology with 90 of my colleagues participated, we actually did it open source because we, all the latex code was, was on GitHub and still is on GitHub. So you can actually go there and you compile the, the thing yourself because the code is still there. So 
This led also to an interest in trying to understand more about kind of the open manuscript type of thing. And I know many people in this room are, are interested in this, but, so I, but I, will, I will talk about a little bit from my, kind of, from my research perspective, kind of coming into this and trying to understand how to go about doing this in, in practice. So I've been, I've been trying many different things. And one of the systems I tested is, is LeanPub, which is kind of a platform and also, I guess, publishing company in, in, in one way. Um, and uh, well, I've, I have a book there called Music Moves, which is, which is out, and uh, it's kind of on LeanPub, it's, it's possible to get automatic kind of builds uh, every day. So if we, when we have a, a Dropbox service where you have write things in Markdown files and, and you edit a file and then new versions, PDFs and eMobi uh, files and EPUB files are updated every night. So that's a very easy way to get things out. Uh, of course, there are some challenges here as well. Um, the challenge inside, um, you don't have any version controller, well, kind of, with, with Dropbox, but not really. Um, there aren't, there's no support for citations, and, and that's also because LeanPub is not really an academic publisher, so it's, it's more for, for data books and these things. But the positive thing is that you can write your code in Markdown, it's easy to share, it has Dropbox um, integration, etc. so it's, it's good also to, to use with colleagues that are not really into GitHub type of things. Um, well, uh, talking about Git, GitHub, um, I'm also, I'm running a conference series, and there we we're making a kind of conference handbook, and we decided to test writing this in Gitbook, um, which is based on Git, GitHub, and it's a, that's been a quite, quite nice experience. All the code is there, we can share it and update it easily. Um, there you can also write in Markdown, you have version control, of course, since it's GitHub, but again, you don't have the citation and the academic stuff, because it's not really an academic publishing platform, but otherwise it's quite nice. Now, for all my academic writing um, and what I push on my students, I, I use Overleaf as kind of a platform to, to write, and that's a, that's a nice tool, uh, of course, because it's, it's built around LaTeX and BibTeX, so you have kind of all of these uh, kind of more powerful tools for, for being able to write. But it's a bit old school with LaTeX these days. Um, many of my students are not really happy about this. Um, the more techy people are, but not the kind of more musical people are. Um, and also then kind of there's not really any integration that it's not very media rich to be to put it like that Then Authoria is another platform we are exploring at the moment Which is an interesting platform because it is media, media rich Kind of not entirely but but at least you can embed audio and video and these things in there and it also you can also um, Write markdown files and have some version control and commenting etc. So it's 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 kind of getting there, um, and we're testing now this out for for this conference series I'm running. Um, we're going to, to test this now next year, where all the submissions will go through Authoria. Um, of course, the issue here is that this is a company, so I'm not sure about the kind of the long term thing about this, particularly for a conference that is fairly. Uh, well, it's not. It's basically me and a few of my colleagues running this thing. So we don't have we don't have a, a big ecosystem around us. Uh, so we need to, to choose a solution that just works and that, that is easy easy to work with. And we don't have any money either. So it needs to be kind of free-ish. Um, now I'm I'm also starting a new book project um, where I have a lot of data. This is coming out of the standstill study that I'm running, and. Here, I've been interested in also exploring how we can integrate the data and plotting and these things in the book itself. So I've been thinking about actually writing this in Jupyter Notebook because I see now that there is more support for being able to really write a, a complete monograph in this. So, so that will be an interesting uh, experience and I'll, I'll be able to come back in a year or so and report on, on how that went. Um, of course, in, with Jupyter Notebooks, um, you have the possibility of integrating all the data and all the, the plotting things, etc. It's not super good on the media side with audio and video, but at least the plotting is, is good. Um, but there are also some issues then, of course, again, integrating this into an academic workflow with citations um, and also, for example, the commenting things that you would get in Authoria. Now, um, some questions then arise from all of this. Um, and I'm a researcher, I'm not a librarian. Um, so, of course, the archiving of all of these things, that's a bit tricky, how to handle all this. And I go to my university library and I ask, ask them all these questions about uh, this system and that system and that, and then, oh, no, that's, it's just too much, right? I mean, I, I go all over, all over the place. But that's what researchers like to do, right? I mean, we're trying to experiment. That's what we're doing. We need to figure out how to move around. And there's, it's not really, there, there aren't really any solutions there, so we need to figure out where to go. But the archiving thing, of course, is a, is a major issue here. And also, as several people have already talked about today, this kind of the credits you get for this, the honor, the points, etc. I'm fortunate, I'm in a tenured position, but when I speak to my graduate students that are going to look for a job in three months from now, 
I need to, I mean, I, I need to help them get a the job as well. And so it's kind of, it's, it's difficult even for me that's kind of really pushing for open research to kind of try to figure out, okay, what should you do? How should you get that job? So we need to, we need to solve that as well. Now, um, so I've been talking a little bit about then open access, open manuscripts, um, and I just also wanted to mention the educational part of this. And it was very nice to hear the, the, the previous talk because I really believe that from an academic point of view, um, the publishing thing and the education thing, to me, they are really intertwined. It's not really that easy to separate them out. So we need to think about this also kind of from an educational perspective. And then, as a music researcher, I have to remind everyone that <laughs> publishing is not only about text, right? I mean, we had data, uh, but also the, there, are, there are other things as well. So, this book that I mentioned on, on Leapub, that's actually it's the textual result of what is actually a multimedia kind of document, you could say. This is a MOOC, um, a massive open online course called Music Moves that we published um, some years ago. This was developed on the FutureLearn platform, um, and it's a six-week um, kind of introduction course to, well, basically what we're doing. Um, it's fun. We're going to run it again from February, so if you want, please sign up, and we, you, can, you can join us. We have several thousand people joining this every time we run it, actually, so it's, it's a really cool, cool experience. Now, um, as it's laid out, this is the six weeks that we have, and then uh, for each of the weeks, you have a lot of different things you should do, and different modules, and then um, the different parts here includes, then you have some text, you have video, you have quiz, and you have other things as well. I mean, normal kind of teaching type of things. Now, the challenging thing then is to try to figure out how can we actually also move these things further, right? And we, we developed this in the FutureLearn platform. And now at University of Oslo, we have this new system called Canvas, which is where we use that's, that's the learning platform. But I figured out now, well, it's not possible to export any of these things from FutureLearn, right? So we have invested a lot of time in putting our stuff into the FutureLearn platform. I can't even get it out to use in our own learning platform at University of Oslo, right? Which is ridiculous. These are markdown files that I personally have written inside of their platform, and they don't allow me to export it. That's horrible. It's really, really bad. Now, I paid a research assistant, a poor bachelor student, to manually go in and copy out all of these things. That's a pain, and it cost me some money, but it's, I managed to get it out, and I put it on LeanPub instead, so, it's, so it's, at least it's there. Um, but again, the problem is the integration here, and we cannot be locked in to different, different systems. And now, right now, we had Canvas at NTNU, they have Blackboard, we're collaborating with them. Well, suddenly, Canvas and Blackboard, don't, they don't really talk to each other, and who knows what we'll have in five years from now. So, from, from my perspective as a teacher and researcher, I really need to have my own data and be able to move it around without being uh, hindered. So, that's more a political statement, I guess. Now, for the video files, uh, at least I had stored them already before I uploaded them. And now we have put them on YouTube. Of course, that's also a commercial platform, so they also have some limitations there. And not now also we get a lot of ads on top of everything, which is not entirely good either. But we can move the videos on further as well. But still, it's a pity that we can't really have these things together. So, well, uh, again, some issues here. Um, archiving, okay, well, how do we solve these things? Again, credit on our points for also for these type of things, and particularly integration with the LMS. Okay, so that's the kind of education side of things as well. Now, let's move on to the open methods side of things. Um, so, uh, as part of our research, um, we are trying to figure out also how to kind of develop ways of studying um, music-related body movement in, in, in better ways. And one of the things we have been working on is developing methods for visualizing body movement in different ways. Well, you could say that visualizing something that's visual already is a bit strange, but on the other hand, having kind of representation that gives you some idea of, for example, the trajectories of a dancer, is, it kind of helps you as a researcher in trying to understand what's going on, right? So, so we, we're doing this type of thing. So this, this is kind of motion history videos that we have here, but also um, this is a method I developed called motion grams, which is kind of like a temporal representation of body movement over time. So it's kind of like a spectrogram, but for, for the body. Um, and by, by plotting this, you're able to look at a 40-second segment of three different dancers and be able to kind of say something about the quality, quality differences in, in what they're doing. So this is a, me a method, right? And it's important to share that method. And you can do that also from, from kind of just by, by words. But of course, then also, uh, we have code as well uh, connected to this. This also links to one of the previous uh, talks here. Um, so open source, of course, is important. Um, so we're developing a lot of toolboxes where uh, we can kind of share these things as well. 
and put these things um, typically on GitHub, or you can, can share them, and definitely need to run some code checker on, on this thing to see if it can be compiled elsewhere as well. Um, but then again, the archiving thing of this is, is a bit challenging. Um, how do we archive code in a systematic manner? Um, now we do snapshots on Synodo, which perhaps is okay. But again, um, how does it connect to everything else that we're doing? And how can we think about uh, this as kind of one complete ecosystem, not as a, just a bunch of different things? Now, open data. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about it right now, but I'll get back to that. But the issue is there, of course, from our perspective, you can mention GDPR, copyright, storage, and archiving, and we'll, we'll get back to this. Now, that was kind of the lengthy introduction to what I'm actually supposed to talk, to, talk about, and that's Music Lab. Um, because with all of these things that we've been working on and doing, etc., we try to figure out, okay, how do, can we actually start working really properly with open research? And um, we had been scratching the surface here and there uh, previously, but now we kind of thought, well, let's try to just jump straight in and do it all at once. Um, so that's what we're doing uh, at Music Lab. Um, so this is a collaboration between RITMO, um, the university library we have in, in Oslo, and um, particularly uh, a brave young librarian that came to me and asked if we could do something together. Um, and that's kind of where Music Lab, Lab started. So the idea here is that we'll, we'll, we start with a research question and we then develop this into a concept for a concert. So a music lab at the core is a concert. A concert outside of the lab in a real world venue with real musicians and real audiences. And that's what we want to do and study. Okay. Then the challenge is to figure out, okay, how do we do this in a meaningful way? So this is a research project, it's a dissemination project, it's an artistic project, it's an educational project, and it's a development project all at once. So um, typically a day of a music lab, um, we have a workshop uh, with kind of some kind of technology or some concept that we are going to explore that day. Um, we also have a panel discussion with a, kind of what we call an intellectual warm-up or warm-down if it's after the concert, but where we have some experts talking about kind of the content uh, or the concept of, of that concert. We also have data collection where we try to collect data on and of the, what's going on on stage, but also on the audiences because we want to look at uh, how the audiences respond to the music in different ways. And we have this concept that we developed called DJing, data jockeying, where we do live analysis of the data being captured during the concert, of both audiences and uh, performers. Um, and this, is, um, this was the first one. We did this two years ago, and um, some pictures. This is from the workshop. We had a fantastic um, uh, music technologist come in. He's working on making a muscle music, kind of the, really the muscles of, of uh, or the, the sound of the muscles and use that in a musical context. So he brought some, some sensors and, and then people um, came and, and were able to test this um, uh, themselves during the day. Then during the evening, uh, we did the, the concert in a real venue where people can, can drink beer and, and uh, they would enjoy themselves. So that's really the kind of, we wanted this to be in kind of normal, normal setting. Then it was the performance itself and a panel discussion where we had uh, people, researchers from different disciplines talking about then what muscles are, what, uh, why muscles move, and why they make sounds and, and how we can use this in, the, in different ways. And then finally we had data jockeying where uh, one of our PhD students was, and she was live coding then um, based on the, the data captured during the event. So up until now we have had four different music labs um, and been kind of exploring different, different technologies, different concepts and have had different, different um, um, both musicians and audiences and also in different venues. The last we only had uh, a few weeks ago as part of the Oslo World um, uh, Festival downtown. We also had a music hack lab where we kind of also expose students to how they can really work with the data also in a, in a longer setting. So, so that's music lab in itself. We're kind of really try to kind of, okay, let's do it all. But of course, this is only part of a larger kind of conceptual development where we really want to work on how we can, can think about uh, doing uh, this type of open research in an in, in artistic context as we're doing here. Um, there's a lot of problem solving that we need to fix, and I'll get back to that. Uh, of course, you want to actually publish on this, the results we get from this as well. 
And finally, I mean, part of the larger ecosystem is also to help in developing the infrastructure at large that we are uh, kind of pushing in, in different directions. But right now, we are mainly on the problem-solving part, so there are more problems than solving at the moment, but we are working on the solving as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, GDPR. Um, and this is important to say because since I'm, uh, I'm working a lot, kind of coming from the arts and humanities where we work with people, right? And, and GDPR is, is something that we really struggle with all the time. Um, and often I, when, when I go to kind of open research, uh, or talk about open research, there's a lot of people from, from natural sciences where there may not be that many GDPR issues, or there may be people from the medical sciences where there are lots of GDPR issues, but where it's so restricted that you can't really do anything. So from the humanities perspective, it's a little bit different, right? Because we have, we're dealing with, well, healthy people, they are adults, and they consent to what we're doing, so it's, it's not actually that bad, but still we have a lot of things, because what we want to do is that we basically want to record people while they drink beer and listen to music, and we want to do research on it, and we also want to put that video online so that other people can do research on it. Okay, did you get that? Did you hear any GDPR issues in that sentence? Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Figure out How can we do this type of research? Because we, we really believe it's interesting to try to figure out how a person moves in around the space during a concert. That's kind of what I want to figure out. How does that, that one person sitting over there nod her head during that performance and entrain to the beat of the rhythm? That's what I'm studying, right? But then I need to be allowed to, to record that person and to store it, and ideally also to share it so that other people can do research on this. But we get into some issues here. Um, on the positive side, we have been working a lot on this over the last year now with a lot of, lots of lawyers from the University of Oslo. We have been working with NSD here in Norway as well. We, can, we have come up with a solution. So we have split the, the group into, we have kind of three different groups now, at least we had this for the last music lab, where we got kind of a general consent thing that you also have here for recording what's going on in this space, but we also got it so that people entering the space will be recorded, that they know that it will be recorded, um, but it won't be close up, but at least it's, it's, that's kind of part of the, the silent consent they're giving by, by participating. Of course, we're also then equipping some of the people and audience members that volunteer. They will be also equipped with some sensors, so we'll measure their muscle tension, their breathing patterns and other things as well going on in their bodies. Um, and then of course, then for the musicians, we are doing, we are recording all sorts of things with them. But that's that's kind of on the easier side of things. So we have managed to solve a lot of these things. I'm not going into the, the details here, but you can talk to me later if you if you want to to hear more about that. Um, on the copyright side, we also had uh, a bunch of issues, and this is also important to mention because this is, may also be particularly for for the humanities and also also particularly for for music studies, but. We want to use professional musicians, world-class musicians, um, in our studies. Um, but then we have some challenges also with their copyrights. Um, so ideally, we would like to be able to share everything that we are recording, including the music, right? And share this with a CC license, CC BY or something else. Um, but then we are also getting into some issues here when it comes to different copyright holders and issues. So we have the composers of the works, we have the lyricists that kind of wrote the text for these things, we have the performers themselves, we have the producers, we have the record companies, we may have a dancer in there, we may have the graphic artist developing that thing and the, the clothing of the, you know, it's, it's um, becoming very complex. And um, these are some of the organizations we have had to deal with to try to figure out how we can handle these things, right? And this comes on top of the performers actually signing that they think it's okay that we share these things, but then it turns out, well, they're not really allowed to do that. They cannot really share their own music. Um, we have to go through the, the companies. That makes sense because they are professional freelance musicians that want to make a living out of this. But the interesting thing from our perspective is that here we have this ideal of open research on one side, and then we have new, and particularly the new copyright directive from the EU, which is uh, stricter than the previous one. And these things, they, they don't really, uh, they are not compatible at all, right? They, that, in the other, on the other hand, they are really uh, not non-compatible in every single way. So that's where we are at the moment. We cannot really figure out how to solve this at the moment. Well, 
The solution now is that we need to use non-professional musicians that are not registered, right? Which is horrible, because we want to use the professional ones, and they also want to take part in these things, but we cannot pay 4,000 kroners per minute per download per, for the videos that we want to share online so that other researchers can, can use it, right? So we have some dilemmas here in how we really turn to move, move forwards. Now, um, also on the storage side, there are some, some issues. Um, so uh, this is kind of more uh, kind of technical things about where to store things. And then there are lots of different solutions here, both kind of in-house, out-house, et cetera. Uh, and and uh, how we should do this in terms of, of formatting metadata, et cetera. But I guess all of those things are kind of more subordinate to the kind of the prim primary questions. And that's really that we want to have give immediate access to these data. Uh, so it's possible to do uh, research on them. Just in the same way that, that this conference is streamed, right? But we are doing it a little bit more extremely because we also want to have research be, that, that could really uh, sit down and do analysis on, on these things right away. We also want it to be flexible, so it can be used and hacked on from many different locations and in systems, etc. Um, and of course, the, there are some challenges because we're also working with fairly large files, and we also need to have integration and synchronization between these different files. So just to give you an idea, so from the last music lab we did now, we had five video streams, one 360 video camera, one thermal camera to kind of there. We had eight channels of audio. We had 13 accelerometers on people. We had questionnaires with text, and we had scores and kind of live coding from one of the performers doing that. And we all had also then the Jupyter Notebooks being developed in real time during the event that kind of did so you could actually follow what was going on. So this is, this is what we work on, right? We need to figure out how. How can we handle this? Who should handle this? Right? Where should we put it? How can we work with these things? Right? And how can we sit down when I have a group of students with different, one, one person working with MATLAB and another with Python, one with SPSS, one with R, Max, PD, whatever. Um, how can they get access to all of this and work on this in a meaningful way and pipeline it further on, right? That's the flexibility we really want to develop. We, want, we don't want to be locked into one particular thing. We want to be, be flexible. And then we cannot put things on, if you, you cannot put a video file on YouTube and analyze it, we need to on some kind of server where you can actually run some code or be able to, to interact with it in, in one way or another. Now, um, so I've posed, presented a lot of challenges here. Um, I, I don't have any solutions, but I, I will point at some some solutions, at least, that, I, that I've, um, I'm thinking about. There are some, some interesting initiatives in the music technology community in, in Europe. This project called Trompa um, is a very interesting kind of integ integration activity between different sound and notation kind of archives. We have also have an initiative called Audio Commons, where the idea is that you can also share audio files in different ways. We have this Repovis from my colleagues in Pompe Fabra, where it's possible to have kind of multimodal kind of um, different streams on top of each other in, in different ways. And I would like to kind of, my, my dream, I could say, is to kind of have a combination of these, uh, plus also kind of a Wikipedia style of kind of flexibility in terms of editing and, and being able to, to add on, on top of things with writing things. Plus, ideally, also kind of the version control thing and collaboration things that you can have from GitHub. Um, and ideally, also the kind of the long-term archival uh, ideals of Zenodo. So that would be my dream scenario come true if we could have that in just a very easy package that I can use. That may be the European Open Science Cloud at some point. I don't know. Uh, other people can tell me. But I want it now, uh, and I, I want to work on it right now. That's my. I'm, yeah. Well, I'm a researcher after all, right? So I, I want I want it to be here now. Um, and then, of course, I also want to have an archive solution, so it's possible to kind of get all of these things archived properly for the future. Um, but that's a bit further further down the, the line, I guess. Okay, I'm getting to the, the, the conclusion here now. It's, it's been a long day. Um, so Music Lab, you could say, is kind of a, uh, it's just trying to kind of explore all of the different challenges we have at the same time. And, in a way, um, this has been a very interesting um, uh, experience over the last couple of years now as we have been working on this and developing the, the four music labs we have had so far, is that by not trying to solve one thing at a time, as kind of we've been doing it in the past, we had this kind of one project where we were trying to do everything at once. Of course, that's total madness and it's chaos and it's 
crazy, and everybody involved thinks this, this is totally unbelievably crazy. On the, on the positive side, we, at least we can th we throw everything up in the air and we try to sit down and piece things together. And it's, uh, it's actually going much better than I had expected. We are able to do something, um, and we are not breaking the law too much all the time, but uh, we're, we're getting there slowly. So you could say that we, are kind of, we have been covering a lot of these things. Also, the education side of things is, is connected to this because we typically involve the students in all of these activities. I, I always had to remind myself and others about kind of the need to integrate um, uh, research and, and, and education in better ways. So by, by doing that and having kind of these events where we do the kind of the hacking together with the students, it's extremely fun, right? I mean, they help out and they develop these, these notebooks and it's, it's really rewarding both for them and, and for me as a, as a researcher. So um, you could say that that's kind of really uh, an important part. What we haven't solved in, in the in context of Music Lab at all is kind of the manuscript and the, uh, the open access part side of things. Um, so that's something we need to kind of, we need to fill that gap somehow. Um, typically, uh, working with Jupyter Notebooks or something like that but would be an interesting thing, but I open for, for other suggestions as well. So ideally then we can have this kind of patchwork fit together and also get the other parts here uh, connected at some point. That would also be, be uh, really, really important for, for getting kind of the, the dream of, of open research become a reality. So um, with that, I think I, I can finish my, my talk here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, that was really fascinating. In my next slide, I'm going to be a music <laughs> researcher. Um, so, uh, questions uh, at the end of the day? Um, yes, one up there. Um, my first question is, uh, it's a real question. I mean, I'm not trying to imply that uh, your research is not useful, but I, I don't know uh, really about what kind of application it can have in real life. If you can just tell me how you apply the results or who can apply the results and in what area. Well, this is basic research. So I really like to say that this is totally useless research and there's no application area at all. And second, do you think that... Second, We're really just curious to, to want, I mean, you know, when half of you are going out of this room, you will put on music and listen to music, right? And that's fantastic. When whatever event you're going to, uh, you have music. So music means a lot to many, very, very, very many people. But yet we know so little about why. Why do you like music? That's what I'm trying to answer. Yeah, I mean, I ask you why you're doing research on this, but uh, <laughs> the second question is, did you thought that maybe the results that you put there can be took and uh, used by some bad people in a bad way? Mm. Well, that's a, that's a good, good question. Um, uh, I guess anything can be used in both good and bad ways, uh, for sure. Um, so, um, in terms of GDPR here, um, in the sense that we want to... Um, make videos available that are of living people, um, that can be absolutely be exploited, I guess, um, in a bad, bad way. Um, on the other hand, if you look at all the other contexts where we are streamed and made um, uh, available kind of visually in our, uh, online to start with, uh, I'm not sure if we're adding that much more to that thing there. Um, but that's, that's a major issue with the GDPR thing. Um, also for the copyright thing, I guess it's, some people may, may say that there are some bad things that can come out of that. If, if we are sharing music that, that musicians could otherwise get paid for uh, individually, that, that may also be kind of a, an issue there. I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but... Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, does then your research need to be controlled, control controlled? Well, what we see, and then this is more on the content side, but uh, from the standstill studies, uh, where we look at, we play music to people and we see if we can actually make people move. Um, uh, yeah, we do see that we can systematically move people with music. And um, that, that, can, that has both good and bad sides, I guess, in terms of how it can use, be used, sure. Um, all our studies are going through an ethical committee before we're doing them, uh, absolutely. Um, but um, 
we are not, we are not, I guess we are not discussing those type of cases uh, directly, but I mean, sound is being used um, in torture, for example, that's, that's well known. So, I mean, there are certainly issues there, um, et cetera. So, so there, are, there are things to consider there. Mm. Thank you. That was very interesting. And I will do the impossible task of uh, trying to be the defense lawyer, telling you that this can be useful. And uh, my case is built on a PhD thesis from my home university called Extending Opera. If you know about that, right? And that talks about empowering the opera singer, the individual performer. And I think that your lab can actually start taking back some of the control from the individual performers from society back, back, back to those artists. And that's why I think that your work may be useful and practical. Thank you. I, I can come up with suggestions for how this can be useful, by the way, but it's, uh, I'd rather say that it's, uh, it's much more fun to say that it's not useful. <laughs> I could mention one example, though, how it's been useful, is that, um, so with the motion grams I developed, which is this kind of structuring of or looking at how bodies move over time, um, it's something that uh, I, I started collaborating with physiotherapists at uh, NTNU uh, and the St. Olaf's Hospital in Trondheim. And um, they wondered whether it was possible to look at the rhythmic patterns of, uh, of early um, uh, of infants, uh, preterm infants, in fact. And uh, we, have, we have collaborated and, and developed a, a kind of toolbox based on, on, on the, the algorithms that I made there so that we have a test now where, where preterm infants are, are screened with a video camera uh, above and, and looking at the rhythmicity of their movements, uh, we are able to then detect whether they are in the risk zone of developing cerebral palsy. At uh, three months of age, you can go in and then can have an intervention so they can get, get help and, and, uh, and get um, physiotherapy treatment. So that's, that's kind of one concrete example of how this type of research can kind of lead to also, yeah. I, I like to say that this can be, yeah, humanities research can, can actually lead to, to clinical uh, applications. Hmm. Okay. Um, ben, uh Another question up there? Oh, good. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, um, I was fascinated by the um, number of different packages and platforms that you've tried out, and I'm in awe of, of your, your being brave enough to try them all and experiment with them all. But actually what really struck me was that I, I was so glad that you mentioned GDPR and copyright issues, because um, these are something that as a humanities researcher obviously that do affect me. I was wondering what you'd um, decided about GDPR, and I'm thinking of it in the context of, say, oral history interviews that I or my team might carry out. and. Traditionally, we um, deposit oral history interviews in an archive, and they are sort of available for consultation later on. And I was just musing recently, hey, wouldn't it be great if we made them all openly available? It'd be so great and useful. And then somebody else pointed out to me that the people we're interviewing might, of course, not want that to happen, and it might shape what they're willing to say to us as evidence if they know it's going to be made public. So I was just wondering how you'd um, debated and resolved, if you have, those issues in your work. Mm. Absolutely, we have that all the time, and I have to say that most of the stuff we're doing at Ritmo in our, and in our lab, we are not sharing openly just because of what you're saying now, because we, are, we have a lot of individuals coming in, and we, we also interview them about their life stories and, and how they have been using music, etc., and, and it would be unethical to share all of that uh, online. So it's only in the case of Music Lab that we really try to make everything openly available, and uh, it's exactly because of the reasons you're mentioning that I think that GDPR is not something we have spoken enough about, and particularly from the humanities side, that's kind of now also getting more interested in, in, in sharing data openly than a lot of, of what we're doing is, I mean, since you're working on people and with people, um, we need to figure out how to be able to share this in one way or another, so, uh, so it's still within, within kind of the GDPR. Yeah. 
I mean, if I might just add a, another comment on that, is that some of the work that I do in the history of peer review involves looking at reports that one scholar has written on another scholar, which traditionally we've considered as confidential. Now, most of my historical work, the people are dead, so it's, it's fine, because dead people have no GDPR rights. But if we want to look at referees' reports from the 1970s rather than from the 1870s, then those people might be alive. And as it happens, I, I, I can go and look at them in the archive, and I can use them, but there's a question about what I can do with that afterwards. Am I allowed to publish that? Am I allowed to publish names? Do I have to anonymize them? Those kinds of things it can be managed. But I was also involved with a project, a European-funded project, that was looking at modern-day peer review, wanting to do the similar kinds of analyses that I'm doing historically, but doing it on modern-day stuff. And then you have this whole question as to whether these peer review reports are available for researchers to look at, because most of the organizations who hold those tend to take quite a conservative approach to the possible copyright and GDPR issues there, and just say, you can't have it, or possibly, because Peary did eventually manage to get some agreements from some publishers, including some of the ones in this room. You can have it, but it'll have to be anonymized in some way. And if it's anonymized, then it's difficult to do things like um, analyze for gender, analyze for career stage, a whole range of other things that you then cannot do because it's anonymized. Um, so this does create challenges for the sorts of research that we can do, um, either openly or not. Um, so open peer review might be a good reason for that, hmm. just as a by the way. Yeah. That's a good comment. Just give you one more uh, example of uh, useful data with your breathing, uh, the data for breathing in the university pedagogy. That would be interesting for people doing lectures. Uh, and I know your data and I know your research, so that would definitely be an expanding um, type of research would be interesting. Mm. Mm. Yes. In fact, a lot of people have been asking about both the breathing data, but also the heart rate uh, and that we sometimes record, or muscle tension as well. Um, and of course, if you're able to kind of capture, have a, have a fairly large database of, of these type of, of, of data from, um, from, from different settings, it's, uh, it's a quite, it's quite interesting data set to look at, with, for example, with machine learning techniques, so yeah. Okay, are we all done with questions for Alexander? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh